Um, good afternoon, um, guests and participants. But I should say we're actually all hoping that you will be participants, because this is a forum designed for a lot of audience interaction. Um, my name is Susan Kiefer. I'm a geology professor here at the university. Um, and this is the second forum on megacatastrophe, science, policy, and human behavior. This is an initiative for this, of the Center for Advanced Study, and it will be continuing all throughout next year. There are two purposes to the forum, forums. The first is to identify and bring together experts from the campus and the community to interact with each other, hopefully on an ongoing basis, about the many aspects of dealing with megacatastrophes. The second is to allow the community to learn about our work and to solicit their input. The take home message is that these large events of nature are going to continue in the future and are going to affect an increasing number of people because of the increasing global population. Understanding the interplay between science, policy, and human behavior will be essential for mitigation. Um, by accident and in hindsight, my career has been a um, continuous study of geologic megacatastrophes, uh, meteorite impacts, large volcanic eruptions, um, and large river floods. And in each of these events, for example, at Mount St. Helens, um, we found that not only the science was important, but the interplay between science and policy and policy and human behavior and science and human behavior was equally important. Um, in organizing the two forums to date, I've discovered that we have on the campus and in the local community both experts in the academic questions and experts in practice and implementation. The academics are prominent researchers in their fields, and the breadth of research and knowledge is truly awesome, as you will see. Our experts in practice are people from the local community who play a prominent role in response to emergencies or disasters. As we met to plan this forum, many of us for the first time, we found that the areas that interested all of us were at the intersection of the science, policy, and human behavior. Well, what's a megacatastrophe? Geologists like myself have a unique perspective on time. We call it deep time. Our studies take us back more than four billion years in Earth history. During the long evolution of conditions on the Earth throughout that time, we have evidence for massive events that would be considered catastrophic on any scale. Rapid outpourings of lava that probably altered the Earth's atmosphere and may have caused extinctions of species. And meteorite impacts on scales to abolish much of life on the planet. Such catastrophes are beyond the realm of human imagination, and they are so big that we really can't imagine mitigating them. I call them gigacatastrophes, because the, which just means they're bigger than megacatastrophes, and we decided we'd leave those for Hollywood to deal with. We as humans are generally limited to imagining and remembering events that occur on the time scale of 100 years or so, about three generations. We and our political institutions do fairly well at coping with the small earthquakes, the small tornadoes, the small weather changes, or the small volcanic eruptions. However, we do quite poorly at remembering, understanding, predicting, and mitigating against disasters that occur on the time scale of centuries to millennia. These are what we're calling megacatastrophes. They dramatically influence humans, but are small enough that we can think about mitigation and preparedness. Candidates for megacatastrophes include hurricanes, tsunamis, large earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, medium-sized volcanic eruptions, small meteorite impacts, pandemics, and perhaps large solar flares. In this forum, we're going to look at a number of issues related to the tragic Pakistan earthquake of October 2005. And I'd like to stress that although we'll be referring to the Mid-America earthquake possibility and setting the scene for that, and perhaps answering some questions about the relation of the Pakistan earthquake to the Mid-America setting, we're going to have a whole separate forum um, on the Mid-America earthquake setting uh, probably next year unless events intervene and have it sooner. The format of the forum is designed to be interactive. We'll have some brief opening presentations by four people. This is a bit misleading about the expertise that we've gathered today because in the cluster of the first couple of rows here are um, a number of the experts from the Katrina Forum that we held last fall as well as a number of others who have participated in helping this new initiative to grow. They're just as much a reservoir of answers as the four who get the brief spotlight. And we just kind of learned the hard way in the Katrina Forum that having about eight people sitting at a little table on a stage wasn't very comfortable. Um, and we decided to try this format. And we'll probably try something else again. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Robert Bauer from the Illinois State Geological Survey. 
Um, he's been with the Illinois State Geological Survey since 1976, and his, em his emphasis is on foundation and underground excavation in rock and soil. He completed his graduate education here at UIUC with the emphasis on foundation and excavation in rock and soil. He's currently head of the engineering geology section, which is responsible for seismic hazard assessment and the evaluation of site construction limitations, slope stability, and underground construction. So if I can get rid of this presentation, um, Bob, if you could come up. And these, these first four presentations will take about 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to discussion. Can't you do space bar? You can do oh, space bar too. Space bar yep. <clears throat> no. Afternoon. I'm going to show just an, just a brief overall setting for the for the uh, Pakistan earthquake in that ha occurred in October in 2005. Even though uh, the setting of the Pakistan earthquake is different than some of the settings throughout the United States, I'm going to do some uh, a comparison of those. Uh, how, how some of the settings, in, uh, earthquake settings in the United States are compared to that. Some of the panelists here have been to the site or their organizations have been there and will share lessons learned. No matter where we are in the world, many lessons learned are, can be universally uh, applied. We know where and how to build for many natural disasters, but in some cases, this clashes with traditions, cultural practices, and economic pressures. This map shows you kind of a worldwide summary of where earthquakes are typically found as red dots, uh, located primarily along edges of plates that are on the surface of the earth. And these plates move around through time. This makes a little more sense when you look at kind of a cut down through the center of the earth where we have convection going on below these plates. It essentially produces like a conveyor belt that moves the plates around. And this runs from about 250 million years ago to, to, to present day. And I'd just like to point out watching the Indian plate crash into the Eurasian plate. And that plate's clipping along pretty fast, and those two plates are still moving towards each other at about one and a half to two inches per year. And where those two plates meet each other, uh, that is, uh, they have sheared up, moved up the rock, lifted it up, and that is the Indian plate moving in towards the Eurasian plate. And this is the formation of the Himalayas and the uh, Tibetan height plateau back behind it. And the movement that takes place then continually and slippage down through a number of these faults is where the earthquakes takes place. If you look at a map here of uh, the Indian continent, and there's a yellow line running through here, that's where the Indian plate is starting to go underneath the Eurasia plate. And then you'll see that the earthquakes are located out, uh, out underneath where that subduction is taking place, and you'll recognize an area here of where that December and December 26, 2004, that 9.0 magnitude earthquake occurred, creating the, the large tsunamis. So that's on the edge of the same plate. Uh, we'll be looking at earthquake activity here at Pakistan earthquake in 2005 up in that area. If you look back over a hundred and some years up in this area, the uh, star, star up here is where the earthquake, uh, the Pakistan earthquake is that we've talked about. But you'll see uh, this is looking at magnitude seven and greater earthquakes over a hundred years in the area. Uh, there are very few, one down here and a couple up over here. And the largest event uh, recent uh, to this one was a magnitude 6.2 event in 1974. Looking at the United States, where do we have some similarities? 
uh, up along the Pacific Northwest here, that is where we have an ocean plate subducting underneath the continent of the United States. Uh, it's just like uh, off the coast of Sumatra. Uh, along here is the famous San Andreas Fault. That's where two plates are sliding past each other. Uh, but we see the closest activity to us is down here in the New Madrid zone. And it kind of looks like a strange place. Uh, but through time, a couple of different things have occurred that have produced and pulled that area apart and pushed it back together again, pulled it apart a little bit, and, and again, it's being pushed back together. And this is looking at about a 20-year time period of, of, of earthquakes throughout the area. Most of these picked up from seismic recorders. Uh, there are about 100 to 200 events per year down in the Madrid area here. You can see the southern part of the state of Illinois. And these form, really, uh, a couple of fault planes there. And because it's in compression uh, east-west, uh, that wants to have these things slide past each other. And that's what produced some very large earthquakes in 1811 and 1812, starting in December, January, and February, uh, magnitudes that were similar to this Pakistan earthquake that we're talking about. Why we should have a wake-up call? Um, this is looking at the, the, uh, the setting for a similar magnitude earthquakes in the upper sevens, close to this uh, Pakistan earthquake and their aerial effect. Uh, in the area, in the west coast, and in, in the uh, mountainous areas, such as in, in the Himalayas, uh, the signals don't run, th don't run through very well through the broken up rock, and are kind of are, are, are slowed down. Uh, here we are sitting in an area where th we have nice flat bedrock that's like a nice bell that's not cracked, and the signals, waves move for a very long, dist far distance. Uh, so when you do, uh, the wake-up call is when we see things happening on the West Coast or, or in the Himalayas, uh, the aerial effect would be 10 times larger uh, in, this, in the central United States. And also, uh, we have, uh, there's a lot of effects that could take place from just, think about the infrastructure that runs through here and railroads going across the Ohio and, and the Mississippi and truck traffic. And we have a lot of pipelines running through here too, taking natural gas and, and, petroleum, and petroleum products. And the other kind of the, the thing that would be very unusual in this, in this area, uh, this, this kind of shows some of the petroleum product running around the country, uh, is that in the New Madrid, there are three segments of the fault and we have three large earthquakes. And that's been repeated looking at studies. We have seen that uh, every 200 to about 500 years, going back about three or four different times. Uh, so if we ever have one, We'll have an event like this Pakistan earthquake. You'll be working at trying to clean up for that, and you'll have another one a month or two later, maybe. And you're trying to work on that, and you'll have a third one, along with a whole bunch of aftershocks that might be as large as the, the Northridge one of 6.7. So that's kind of a comparison in a, in a setting for the Pakistan one and some of the things that uh, we're looking at in, in, this, in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Jerry Hodger. He's a professor of structural engineering in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and deputy director of the Mid-America Earthquake Center. After September 11th, he helped Minnesota, um, the state of Minnesota, building officials, emergency response managers, first responders, and structural engineers partner to improve the disaster response plans in Minnesota, and he thus gained firsthand experience at the level of preparedness that now exists for any event of reasonable size and scope. Although Jerry has not been in Pakistan recently, he graciously agreed to present on-the-ground observations taken by several of his UIUC colleagues who were there. So. If I can just. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everybody. As Susan said, uh, the Mid-America Earthquake Center sent a reconnaissance team to Pakistan about one month after the earthquake and included our director, Amr al Nashai, He's a structural engineering professor here at the University of Illinois, as well as Yusuf Hashesh. He's a geotechnical engineering professor here at University of Illinois, both in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. One of our structures graduate students, Sun Jig Kim, went, and two other faculty, one from University of Illinois at Chicago, Aref Masood, and uh, from Rice University, 
Ahmad Durrani, who uh, led the reconnaissance mission. And I'll be reporting on their findings. Uh, Bob Barr gave a, a good summary of the earthquake, magnitude 7.6, occurring in the northeast portion of Pakistan. And if you look at the path of the uh, reconnaissance team, it started in Islamabad, uh, where they met with high-level government officials and military officials. And then the military escorted them uh, through the damaged zones. They actually had uh, excellent access, uh, were able to take photographs at will. In fact, the uh, general who lined up the reconnaissance mission and enabled the uh, trip is a graduate of the University of Illinois, so that worked out uh, somewhat coincidentally. Uh, the team went up to uh, several villages up into the mountainous region, including Balakot, where severe damage occurred, and then down to uh, Musafarabad. Uh, uh, and you could see the ep epicenter in the, uh, just to the northeast of that rather large town with a population of over, over a million. So there was a heavily populated region here where the damage occurred. Zooming in a little bit more, you can see the region is quite mountainous. A lot of the towns are in the uh, valleys between the mountains, Balakot up in this region, Musafarabad down in this region here, and the epicenter would be up here. And then they hit, uh, went through several villages along the way. The heaviest damage occurred in two provinces, Azad Kashmir, down in this region, and Northwest Frontier Province, up in this region, sustained about 70% of the damage. There was also some damage uh, in India, to the east of the uh, borderline here, in purple. And there was one major collapse in Islamabad, a, a multi-story concrete structure, as well as about 30 other structures that were damaged. As Bob Bauer said, the affected zone, about 30,000 square kilometers, 3.2 million to 3.5 million people are estimated to have been affected. Uh, the estimates of the casualties, the deaths are on the order of 80 to 100,000. Uh, about 80,000 people injured. That's a very high ratio of deaths to injured. And I think it says, uh, speaks a lot to what was happening on the ground. 400,000 structures damaged. That's a catastrophic number. They're estimating about 500,000 families if you take seven people uh, per family here to get three and a half million. This breaks down the damage uh, in the two provinces that were most affected, Northwest Frontier Proce uh, Province and Azad Jammu Kashmir. Uh, for example, you could see in Balakot, looking at the uh, dead and injured, as well as the fully damaged and partially damaged buildings, uh, you could see uh, significant numbers of uh, casualties here, as well as damaged buildings. And then in Musafarabad, uh, quite catastrophic, over 100,000 buildings fully collapsed. Uh, they were in the region uh, just over a month after the earthquake, uh, and these are photographs that they took. This shows a rather common occurrence. This is in Balakot. This is a ridge, so these would be essentially in the, in the foothills or the valleys between the mountains, uh, where because of some of the ridge effects, uh, the soil had major shifting, and so the foundations of the structures were affected and led to total collapse. This would have happened uh, within a few seconds after the earthquake started. You could see another view of uh, quite complete damage that occurred along these ridges. Uh, there are many areas like this. This shows uh, one of the main streets in Balakot. Uh, these were two-story structures, uh, somewhat more modern. Uh, the the uh, views I showed in the prior slides were mostly unreinforced masonry structures, uh, predominantly housing structures. Uh, these would have been shops and such. And here, the first floor had a soft story and essentially sheared to the side and collapsed down. So we're looking at the second floor. Here. These would be lightly reinforced concrete structures generally or unreinforced masonry structures. Uh, the bridges in general fared a little bit better, but certainly some of them had significant damage. If you look at the tops of the piers here, you could see that they've shifted uh, quite dramatically several feet. This is extremely expensive uh, to repair this kind of damage. And some of the ridge effects are quite clear here, where you could see the cracks that are occurring. Uh, in the soil, and again, this would loosen the foundations of the structures and lead generally to complete collapse. Oops. Let's try that again. Well, I think the Macintosh here is playing with my slides, uh, but there's a few uh, landslides that were quite significant here, and uh, it has a mind of its own. Uh, but we, uh, it could be. Uh, but we can see right here, for example, uh, that the uh, 
whole sides of mountains came down, uh, covered over the river valley, and created lakes. Uh, let me try to go back to a couple of shots because they're uh, really quite dramatic and indicative of uh, many landslides that were occurring in the region. Uh, you could see again here whole sides of mountains essentially coming down. And unfortunately, that best shot is uh, not going not to be visible to us. My apologies for that. Uh, with respect to semi-engineered structures, uh, these would have had a, a light amount of engineering. In other words, they'll use fairly standard construction practices to build these. Uh, in Musafarabad, uh, there was, uh, again, significant damage that occurred with buildings uh, being reduced to complete rubble or partial collapses, such as we see here. If the building didn't collapse, many of them certainly need to be condemned. For example, the school building, uh, you could see, has uh, quite significant damage throughout the structure. This is a modern building uh, in the town uh, that had fairly substantial pancaking. This was quite indicative uh, if they did not get complete collapse. And perhaps most significant, some of the engineered structures suffered uh, severe damage, if not collapse. This is a military hospital. This was an engineered structure for the military, which of course is quite dominant in Pakistan. It suffered uh, dramatic damage, and there are a couple of reasons for this. First, their building codes are uh, inferior. And second, uh, their construction practices uh, lead to lightly reinforced structures, uh, even if the building codes often call and the engineering dra drawings often call for more heavily reinforced structures. Where there was reinforcement, it was also often placed in incorrect regions. And so it's a mix of uh, building codes, engineering practice, construction practices, and uh, perhaps most importantly, the inspection. The last shot from the region shows the tent cities that were occurring for the refugees uh, following the earthquake. Uh, they're estimating on the order of 2.6 million people displaced uh, by the earthquake. Some of these occurring uh, in riverbeds that are now artificially dammed up by the landslides that you saw and also uh, quite susceptible to liquefaction if there's a subsequent event. So I hope these uh, tent cities are quite temporary. And I wanted to finish with a couple of slides that relate to the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Uh, Mid-America Earthquake Center has about 30 faculty, 65 graduate students. We've done for a number of years uh, quite a bit of research on what could happen in Mid-America. With respect to an earthquake, we cover the seismology, the hazard, uh, inventory of uh, structures in the region, uh, engineering of the uh, current construction and new construction, and a lot of social science to study the uh, social impact and economic impact. Uh, as Bob Bauer showed quite effectively, a larger area is likely to be uh, affected if an earthquake of this size occurs in the region. Population just from Memphis to St. Louis is roughly similar to Pakistan, and a much larger population could certainly be affected. And while the general construction and inspection quality are better, uh, the building codes in the regions have generally not required seismic engineering, and so there's certainly large numbers of completely vulnerable structures. This includes hospitals, fire stations, schools, uh, and uh, the housing stock. Hospitals and emergency response operations, temporary housing, evacuation are certainly likely to be completely overwhelmed if there's an earthquake of significant size in the region. And of course, this will happen with no warning. Uh, as part of our research, we've developed a program called MAVIS, which does regional loss assessment uh, and risk management to provide support for decision makers in, in prioritizing limited resources. This shows a view of Memphis, Tennessee. This would be the Mississippi River. This shows the street network, as well as in green and orange, the gas pipeline network in the region, the cast iron pipeline network. Uh, we could see for an epicenter that's quite far away, about 100 miles away in this scenario, we're still getting moderate damage in the gas pipeline network. And then the critical facilities are shown with damage bars, and I blew up a portion of it here. Uh, so the red crosses would be the hospitals, the white circles on the base would be bridges, the purple squares would be schools, and so on. And the damage bars show the likelihood of severe damage in red, moderate damage in yellow, and light damage in blue. Uh, you could see as you get closer to the epicenter, you're certainly going to be more likely to have uh, severe to moderate damage. And if you aggregate these losses, you could start to get some estimates of what can happen. Uh, in a regional basis, for example, we could estimate on the order of $16 billion in damage. Uh, 
Uh, we can uh, estimate the likelihood of, that hospital beds will be in place, say, seven days after the event. We're estimating maybe 15% of the hospital beds will be active with potentially thousands of dead or injured, tens of thousands displaced in the region. And then if you look at a town like Cairo, Illinois, in southern Illinois, potentially sitting right atop uh, potential epicenters, uh, this small village would be completely decimated by an earthquake. And you could see our estimates of the damage bar based upon current construction, $750 million in damage, which would be quite significant for a small town uh, like this. And so just some final acknowledgments uh, for the team that went uh, to Pakistan, sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the May Center. And our website here has uh, a report that they've written that documents all of this damage and uh, a much larger report is now currently in the works. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Well, our next speaker is um, Irfan Ahmed. He's, an associate, he's the Associate Director at the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology here at UIUC. He works at the frontiers of bio and nanotechnologies with particular application to agriculture, food, and medical technologies. So why is he here with us today? Well, he's here with us because of his knowledge, concerns, and caring for the people in the devastated regions of the Indo-Pak subcontinent. He'll be commenting on a combination of policy and human behavior from a very unique perspective. You're fine. Let's see. We call ourselves mega cats. And I'm toying with whether it should be mega catats for catastrophe. Um, we're thinking of a t-shirt, but a number of us are dog owners, and so we've run into some, some interesting dialogues on a lighter note. Um, you can use the space bar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sue, for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, the earthquake in Pakistan. Most of the, the technical aspects uh, have been covered, and uh, I'll try to focus on uh, the policy aspects and uh, and some of the religious social aspects uh, covering how people uh, think about it. Most of the technical data has been covered, so I'm going to skip this slide for now. One of the things at the bottom of the slide is the number of animals killed is 0.5 million, which will give you a sense uh, when I talk about it later that uh, in terms of uh, how their livelihood has been affected and the estimated cost of reconstruction being $5.5 billion. Okay, so uh, as you see, I mean, I'm talking about here policy and constraints. Uh, in Pakistan, the, 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 the earliest laws or the regulations which came to being were in 1952 and 1958. And so you could tell that uh, they, they are pretty much uh, outdated and, and so new laws uh, and regulations are needed. The building codes, uh, the, the, the Jerry uh, alluded to some of it, is the, the reason about the building codes, that the building codes are there. But the issue with that is that it's difficult to implement. And primarily due to the lack of enforcement, uh, due to uh, corruption on one end and poverty on the other end, in terms of because the, 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 uh, the enforcing uh, uh, inspectors are locally known and so they, they would either, uh, due to family connection and all this stuff, and at the same time, somebody not having the ability to put that extra uh, uh, rupee or a dollar uh, to add to the construction cost uh, would forego that kind of thing. And so in the short term, I mean, they, they, they can gain uh, because of uh, some sort of a saving. All those studies have st stated that that's not to be the case. But in the long run, of course, you can see what happens. Now, one of the other things which uh, has happened in this particular aspect is the telecommunications. And so the Pakistan government's policy of uh, not opening uh, telecommunications to uh, generally to a wider segment of uh, the, the population and, 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 the, and the international uh, companies and uh, people uh, put a uh, constraint on how they could potentially operate. And so that restriction on electronic and mobile uh, media uh, was a bottleneck in this uh, particular uh, re recovery and relief effort. Then on the other side, I mean, as you have seen some of the maps uh, that Pakistan bordering with India, and one of you is much familiar with the issues regarding Kashmir and the line of control, 
So that also had proposed uh, severe uh, restriction and issues about how and who can access those regions and what they can do uh, in, in terms of uh, the help in that region. One of the aspects was that, such an example, that, uh, that there was a huge need for helicopters to, to, to pass on the delivery because of the train. And so there was an estimated need for 130 helicopters. And so at that time, there were only 35 or 40 helicopters uh, operating. So uh, while the international uh, effort was being garnered to get the helicopters and the U.S. was getting about 30 or some from uh, moving it from Afghanistan and, and the NATO was still uh, coming. India had offered about five to 10 helicopters, but the condition was that they, they would have their own pilots, uh, the Indian pilots. And so that was not acceptable to Pakistan. Pakistan said that if you uh, give us the helicopters, we'll fly it. So that arrangement did not work. So you could see that uh, how that impacted in terms of uh, the relief effort to some, some degree. Uh, and then, uh, th this is not part of the policy, but at the bottom of the slide it says, tragedy within a tragedy. And that's the, that's the key uh, 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 aspect of, uh, of this is that uh, there, is, th there is this large uh, 7.6 uh, uh, earthquake, and then while we were sitting here and talking, there's a tra tragedy continues to be unfolding because of the harsh winter. And so there are, there potentially are areas which may not have been reached as yet. And that's why you've seen a range of numbers being floated around of the kill between 83,000 to 100,000 because some of it is an extrapolation and some, some areas are not even, the government census doesn't cover them because they are remotely, very remotely located. And the only access to those areas is through dirt tracks and not even their jeepable tracks. And then, uh, as I mentioned about these animals, uh, the, the, so th this is their only livelihood. They would have, ch ch they would have ch ch chicken poultry, and they would have cattle or a ch ch sheep or uh, the, some sort of it, and that's, that's their uh, livelihood. And so 70% of those families are affected because of the reason that uh, uh, these uh, animals are uh, killed. Now, the paradox of the relief effort is that US and NATO uh, applied, uh, uh, offered help, and of course uh, they, they, they were instrumental in, in the relief effort. But the way it was viewed locally is that uh, as it was hostile to Pakistan's interest that maybe uh, U.S. is eavesdropping uh, on Pakistan and Pakistan territory and with the geopolitical uh, conditions that are prevalent right now that you're all aware of, uh, it was uh, seen by some quarters, some uh, segment of the population to be the case. And so, so that really restricted how they operated and, uh, and also uh, security concerns associated with that. Now, regarding Pakistan-India equation, uh, the, while the people-to-people -people help was coming, especially on this Kashmir divide, because there were proportions of uh, the earthquake uh, which affected the Indian and, and, and held Kashmir and on the Pakistani side also. But people, they were relatives across on the line of control, but the governments were not willing to trust uh, the, each other. And so it took months of foot dragging actually to open the border or establish five uh, entry points. And initially, the, the, the Pakistan said five, India said three, the, then who would man those and all those details. And so that, that was also an operating constraint. And then the, the another aspect of this relief effort was the operation of the local NGOs and, uh, with the extremist agenda. And so uh, the, while any help is, is welcome, and those, those who are uh, from the, know the train locally are the best uh, people to actually help in tragedies of this sort. Uh, so, but at the same time, they were being viewed as, uh, uh, as uh, suspects and extremist agents, and maybe they have an agenda, and so on and so forth. And that was also, and so the, there was a pressure from Western countries on, on the, the Pakistan government uh, not to let them operate in that region. And so those were the uh, operating constraints in the region. Now, what, uh, some of, with anything uh, tragic which happens, 
there might be some good which comes out of it. And so uh, one is that the thought process got rolling in terms of well, what was amiss here and what, what needs to be done and so on and so forth. So hence, uh, so subsequently, the Pakistan government has uh, set up a, a, a federal disaster relief man management agency that's just modeled on the FEMA that we are familiar with. And another one is called the Disaster Relief Commission. And so the first one, I guess, is, uh, is directly reports to the prime minister. The, the, the third is the Earthquake Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Authority, which was established immediately. And again, uh, it was uh, uh, headed by the, uh, the uh, general and, uh, in the Corps of Engineers. And then a national volunteer movement uh, was, was started, actually, for those who, uh, who would like to help uh, in this earthquake. Another initiative was this, uh, the, it's an, a, a non-governmental uh, organization, uh, participatory de development initiatives, and that is research-based. So most of the uh, things which are done in developing countries and Pakistan also like are, are just like reactive and uh, for lack of a better term, a knee-jerk uh, reaction and getting things uh, quickly back on pace and get, get over with it and not uh, thinking through in terms of uh, that what uh, next, uh, uh, if it happens, and again, we have seen the report from the Mid-America Earthquake Center that there's a potential for uh, earth earthquake of uh, eight or plus uh, in the near future, which would include Islamabad. And then they've held technical symposia uh, uh, with the Higher Education Commission, and that's what uh, the team is returning uh, the later part uh, of this month, early March, actually, uh, to, uh, to hold uh, the, the, the discussions and symposium, and that's a, a good aspect of this. And then the recently I just saw uh, is that uh, the, the, the teams based in, a think tank based in the uh, UK actually have proposed that uh, to, to set up a, uh, economic uh, the, the, the zones uh, based on the duty-free models on both sides of the line of control. And that really actually is a very uh, uh, unique idea in terms of the fact that Pakistan and India have been talking about uh, solving the political issues, uh, they, but some of the other people have always expressed the, the fact that if they are connected economically, there's a much uh, greater hope actually in resolving some of the issues on the table. So with, what are the leading relief units? Pakistan Army, civil defense. Civil defense has been in existence in Pakistan uh, since the early uh, the formation of Pakistan, but, uh, the, the, but uh, has just uh, been in oblivion uh, because no resources were put. Uh, Red, the, the Red Crescent, which is the equivalent of uh, Red Cross, uh, ED Foundation is a private-run uh, uh, NGO, uh, and has offices in New York and several other European countries, and is the largest uh, ambulance uh, service uh, they, probably in the world, and others. Then one of the key aspects of these tragedies in a structure like Pakistan in these uh, uh, societies uh, based uh, in, in the region is these family support structures. And they, those are very helpful, actually, and these were some of the the things which happened, and uh, citing from a personal uh, example, that my wife's uh, aunts were displaced actually in Muzaffarabad, and, and they have been relocated to my uh, in-laws in Islamabad, and so they, they, these are some of the examples that actually happen, and they, till today, they and their cousins are living actually uh, for, for an extended time, uh, because their uh, house or dwellings were made uh, the, the, uh, unlivable at, the, at that time, and they were lucky that they survived, but many of their rel extended, extended relatives actually perished uh, in of Rabat due to the building collapses. Then the NGOs, including US and UK based Pakistanis, those were of great help, especially the Association of Pakistani Physicians in North America, and they, they have sent a lot of medical teams and similarly from UK. Religious support structures, again, people in the mosques and other areas, and then they're providing facilities to do that. UN relief agencies, International Red Cross, and, and several other agencies like the uh, Islamic Development Bank, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. So what is an integrated multi-sectoral process? I mean, in terms of planning and implementation, prevention, hazard assessment, mitigation of the uh, of, of, of potential, uh, the, 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 uh, potential disaster, preparedness, response and recovery, and rehab and reconstruction. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit, religious, social aspect. What, what, what does the Quran say here about uh, the, the earthquake? but they insolently defied the command of their lord, so the stunning noise, which refers to earthquake, seized them even while they were looking on. Another words in the Quran, it says, do you feel secure that he who is in heaven will not cause you to be swallowed up by the earth when it shakes? 
Uh, and then, so similarly, so such uh, references have also been made whenever an earthquake has occurred in the in Western uh, the, the countries, including U.S., uh, quoting from Samuel, then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wrought. And similarly from uh, the Psalms and, uh, and, and Jeremiah. So uh, you could see that, I mean, that some of the people of faith actually, how they approach tragedies and how they look at it from, from a religious standpoint. People have said, and, uh, the, 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 and I've been told that, I mean, the data is not shown to be the case, but there is strong evidence that uh, the people who think they, they've observed this is the change in animal behavior in terms of before an earthquake, or actually before an, any uh, major disaster, because they could, so the birds, they, they either fly away, or the, the animal behavior becomes bizarre, and they become a little edgy, and so on and so forth, and those have been reported, or at least uh, seen in some of the cases. But of course, the scientific community has discounted that, and my take is that uh, there should be the more research done in that. Examples in tsunami have indicated that, and they, they, there are people who have seen that. I mean, now, the only question is uh, whether that disaster is an earthquake or a tornado or whatnot, because the birds have this ability of uh, hearing the waves or uh, the, the before uh, the, we, we, the humans, can detect it. So can they be used as a predictors or detectors? That's the question to ask. The folklore, earth is held by a big horned bull on one horn. When he gets tired, he switches the horn, and the earth shakes. Another one from a Hindu analogy is it is also believed that eight mighty elephants hold up the land. When one of them grows weary, it lowers and then shakes the earth. So that's another way. And this across, uh, across, almost across the globe. The myths are, OK. Recent, in, the, in, the region, in this region, recent introduction of cable TV in the region uh, resulting in degradation of Islamic values. So the question arises is, that what about Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad, which are the, the largest uh, the, 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 the population centers with the largest cable centers, and so on and so forth. So yes, but there are people who look at it from that standpoint. Modern myth is that some people believe that the uh, immunity in terms of protected from a large earthquake because of the fact that their home is safe, because there's been a lot of shaking and steam has been let out. But that seems not to be the case, and our experts can uh, uh, relate to that, that modern earthquake of five or releases only 1,000 of energy, but it raises by, by order of magnitude, it goes beyond six and seven. And so that seems not to be the case. So whenever we are looking at the hazard, we have to look at the biological, I mean, the, the, what hazard we are looking at, what hazard area we are in. So if we are in New Madrid fault line, those, those are the, some of the disasters, they're potentially an earthquake. But in other areas like Mount St. Helens and others, I mean, there could be uh, volcanic eruptions, and there could be in other areas could be uh, the, 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 uh, the tornado uh, alley or or a tsunami, and so so all of these have to be hazard uh, the, the, the region specific hazard analysis needs to be done. That's all I have to say. So. Thank you, Irfan. Um, our fourth speaker is Max Edelson, who is an assistant professor of history here at University of Illinois. His research focuses on the environmental, economic, and cultural history of colonial America and the Atlantic. However, his new research project involves examination of the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 as a touchstone event that changed the way people from Brazil to London understood the fate of Europe's American empires. And so he's going to give us a historical perspective on the effect of big earthquakes. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, especially to hear some of the technical explanations for how earthquakes really work. In my field, the be best scientific minds of the day believe that God had planted some sort of explosive minerals beneath the surface of the earth, and when he wanted to condemn the Portuguese for the Inquisition, he released them in the Lisbon earthquake of 1755. So in a sense, um, <clears throat> The Lisbon earthquake is important historically because it initiates interest in what's going on beneath the surface of the earth that results in 
historical inquiry into geology and the science of seismology. What I'd like to do today is just introduce this historical earthquake and then abstract three uh, lessons or comparative approaches to earthquake study that I think we can apply beyond uh, Lisbon itself. Lisbon uh, is probably the worst earthquake of the 18th century, uh, one of the worst earthquakes in uh, recorded history. It struck Lisbon, Portugal on November 1st, 1755, which was All Saints Day. Many of the dead were buried in the rubble of their churches because of the holiday. Those that were spared that fate were, uh, had to fight their way through fires that raged through the city, many of them caused because candles, the, all the churches were illuminated for All Saints Day, fell down and started burning tapestries and, and starting fires and whatnot. Um, and those who survived that had to face three tsunamis that in quick succession swept through the harbor and into the neighborhoods of Lisbon and intense aftershocks that followed for uh, the next 24 to 48 hours. A week later, Lisbon, which had been the fourth largest city in Europe, um, one third of its 250,000 residents or around that number were dead after the Lisbon earthquake. Um, so let's. What I'd like to do, this first slide is um, one of hundreds of images that circulated around Europe and America in the aftermath. It's an engraving from Germany sometime uh, after 1755, the late 18th century. And what it shows is uh, refugees who are forced to retreat to a camp in the outskirts of Lisbon. We see the, uh, the harbor, the ships uh, sinking in the harbor, buildings crumbling and flames erupting uh, from, uh, from uh, the fires that, that took over Lisbon. So the first sort of principle or approach to earthquake study that I'd like to propose is that mega catastrophes in general, like earthquakes, can initiate uh, what some have called paradigm shifts. And these paradigm shifts can happen on multiple levels. Um, the term paradigm shift is uh, from the historian of science, Thomas Kuhn. And he uses it to describe sudden and dramatic shifts in scientific in scientific ideas that took place, especially during the Enlightenment. Um, but I'd like to just use it in a general sense to describe a sudden way in which people rethink the way they see the world, rethink the way the world works in a basic sense. So the Lisbon earthquake disrupted basic understandings of, of the way the world works for early modern people in Europe, in America, uh, really anywhere that people heard about it. And let me just tell you about one example of this that I'm researching at the moment, and that has to do with the world of trade and long distance commerce in the Atlantic world. Long distance traders really depend on careful assessments of risk so that they can uh, figure out how much it costs to ship things across an ocean, so that they can buy insurance, so they can plan their business and after Lisbon, it's, it's my hypothesis anyways, uh, the idea about risk and trade shifted dramatically. And let me just give you uh, one example from a merchant who is operating out of Wilmington, North Carolina in the 1750s. Um, he's trying to figure out how much, uh, how much this cargo he's sending out is going to cost him, how much he can expect in return. And he writes to one uh, of his correspondents. He writes, in case of any uncommon calamity such as Lisbon, he wrote, all may fall. In other words, no matter how much planning he could do to prevent um, uh, his cargo from uh, losing money, if something big, a mega catastrophe happened on the scale of Lisbon, and he didn't even have to say the Lisbon earthquake, he just had to say Lisbon, everyone knew what he was talking about, um, he would go bankrupt, everyone involved would go bankrupt. So there's a new consciousness about risk that wasn't present before Lisbon. And the question I'm asking is, how long did this last? How can we measure it in terms of changing insurance rates, changing ways in which trade was structured? But in a general sense, paradigm shift occur because of mega catastrophes and we can start investigating what kinds of paradigm shifts and how long they lasted. This is another uh, uh, engraving um, also from Germany uh, published right after uh, the earthquake in late 1755 and it also sh it shows a refugee camp from Lisbon in the uh, foreground you see the tent cities uh, even the royal family lived in a tent city and then in wooden barracks after the uh, royal palace was destroyed in the center of Lisbon. You also see in the mid uh, ground um, the summary executions and hangings that uh, took place to prevent looting uh, during the Lisbon earthquake. This was a subject of a lot of commentary as people were reporting on the Lisbon uh, earthquake. Um, my second principle that I'd like to propose is that mega catastrophes, including earthquakes, undermine a progressive vision of the future. 
the idea that social, economic, and intellectual conditions are bound to improve in the world really takes a beating as an as a assumption that people have in the aftermath, especially in the immediate aftermath of one of these major disasters. We can just look at our own experience as a nation with Hurricane Katrina to see how that might be so uh, from our own experience. After Lisbon, uh, one English writer wrote, quote, an earthquake is an unforeseen, unavoidable, relentless, all-devouring evil. No wisdom can calculate its approach or say when or where or in what manner it will spend itself. No power can withstand its force. No speed or sagacity escape the reach of it. He that shall go to save his life may lose it, and in endeavoring to run from death, we may run directly into it. Earthquakes, in other words, unravel assumptions that the world is a place of security, continuity, and predictability. And I would guess, ask, just ask the same research question I asked of the paradigm shift. How long do the, does that uncertainty last? Is it enduring? Um, how long does it take for people to sort of forget that it happened and move on to a sort of normal state of affairs, if ever? For many thinkers in the aftermath of Lisbon, the event drained the life out of the idea that there was a noble moral dimension to human experience, that human experience was basically good and that it was destined to get better in the future. John Wesley, uh, who many of you may know as the founder of uh, Methodism, uh, was really disturbed by Lisbon when he gave a sermon on it. Um, uh, he saw the most disturbing thing about it as the rise of the idea that the world operated not in terms of moral agency of God, the creator, but in his words, on the agency of blind material causes, a very dispiriting realization for a spiritual leader. He fought against the idea that human events were the product of chance, but this was harder and harder case to make in the aftermath of something like Lisbon. Um, my final slide and my final point is an engraving that we know is a little more accurate perhaps than the others because it was done by uh, these French engravers who were actually present in uh, Lisbon uh, shortly after the earthquake and it shows the ruins of one of the major churches, uh, St. Nicholas uh, Church. Uh, this was published in Paris in 1757. The third principle or approach I'd like to suggest about mega catastrophes is that for those who survive them, they diminish people's sense of human enterprise. After Lisbon, people saw themselves, their governments, uh, and their society's most ambitious projects as suddenly very small, very untenable. What did it mean for the Portuguese that so much blood and treasure in recent decades before Lisbon had been spent on preserving their possession of the colony of Brazil when the whole capital of their empire, empire was then in, in rubble, in ruins, just in a matter of hours? In Europe, that the idea that the, of the earth as being an immeasurably old place, what Sue referred to as deep time, uh, took hold and kind of lodged, in my view, in scientific understandings. The emerging science of seismology sought to unravel the uh, mysterious shifts and movements that were taking place under the surface of the earth over vast stretches of time. Compared to all this drama that people were just beginning to grapple with, human affairs suddenly seemed very inconsequential. So I guess as a historian, my, my general view is that um, I'm supposed to study things in specific times and specific places. What happened in Lisbon in 1755 doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what happened in Pakistan uh, more recently. But it's hard to neglect that some of these same things I'm seeing in Lisbon, uh, some of the religious explanations, some of the pessimism, the shock to the system culturally that they cause seem to be reoccurring. So um, I think there's real room for new comparative studies uh, of earthquakes and mega catastrophes over time and through these basic historical questions and perhaps many others. Thank you, Thank you Max. Um, now, unlike a class, we're actually available for questions and answers till 5.30. Um, you can see what happens when you ask professors to give five-minute talks. Um, so I promised 20 minutes, and we got a really interesting hour. Um, I'd like to just take a minute, if I can do this right, to put up something which um, Liesl uh, Wildhagen at the Center for Advanced Study prepared for us. Whoops, that's not it. <laughs> Let's see if I can get out of this. Um, and it's, it's a web connection, which if you're sitting here, which one is it? Liesl, is it? It's Explore. So that's Word. There's Explore. Um, this is a seismic monitor uh, that you're looking at directly, and if an earthquake happens, 
while we're sitting here, supposedly this will update and you'll see it. Oops. Oh, I think, and I haven't had any exposure to this. And you see um, in red actually are the earthquakes that have happened today. Um, the size of the circle denotes the magnitude, so these are probably magnitude four, roughly. Here's a, an orange one that happened yesterday that's a bigger one. Um, we're sitting here. Hopefully one won't happen here while we're sitting here. Um, and I'm going to stop touching this and just leave it. Now, in the audience, you probably may have seen me looking at people and smiling because a number of us were here for the Katrina Forum, and a number of points came out very much the same from, for example, Max, who wasn't at the Katrina Forum. Um, and particularly, Amy Gaida is one of our experts, um, and the question about law and looting came up in the Katrina Forum. Rob Olshansky from Regional, uh, Regional and Urban Planning is here. Uh, Laura Joseph is a librarian helping with research on this. Did I mix, miss any? Oh, and Robert McKim is from Religious Studies, and, and we've been communicating some thinking about things. So I'd like to open the floor now for questions from the non-megas, if you have any. We have microphones here, and this is being videoed for web streaming. So if you would step up to a microphone and identify yourself for questions, that would be helpful. I'm Jim Beverly, a re retired consultant, a native Chicagoan, and uh, I never thought about Lake Michigan and earthquakes, and I'm just curious what might happen to the Great Lakes with an earthquake. Aha, I'm glad somebody's going to volunteer. <laughs> I'm going to give this to Bob Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just got volunteered. Uh, uh, you know, we've looked at this. For, for a tsunami to develop, you pretty much have to have ground movements below the water body. And we don't have the fault systems and the earthquakes below, below the lake there. There have been some smaller waves produced not, that, are, that are, are recognizable from an earthquake that's near a body of water, uh, such as there, um, in, uh, Tim, is it 1909? There was a, a larger, a, a largest earthquake in northern Illinois. It's estimated to be about 5.1 in northern Illinois in 1909. Uh, some riverboat folks saw a wave on the river that was unusual that they related to that. And I believe there was also a wave on Lake Michigan that was about five, four or five foot high. But we're not talking about destructive tsunami type waves. Uh, again, that would only have, you'd have to have the land shifting along the fault below the water body to, to produce things like that. Does that an answer your, your question? A bit. A bit. Are there any other questions? Steve? Uh, I have a question for Max. Um, is it true that Voltaire had uh, a change in his thinking about the world as a consequence of the Lisbon quake? And if so, what was it? Yeah, I think. Um, Kind of one of the reasons that I was attracted to the Lisbon earthquake is that there's a whole body of scholarship that deals with the intellectual impact of Lisbon, especially because people like uh, Voltaire and Rousseau and others are uh, philosophers of the, of the European Enlightenment are commenting extensively on it. Voltaire's, uh, I don't know if it changed Voltaire's thinking, but it allowed him to illustrate his thinking about sort of the, 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 the lack of a progressive future that, uh, that the world had, how much human experience was subject to chance and disorder. And of course, um, his novel Voltaire, I mean, uh, his novel Candide, is uh, sort of all about this question. And it's part of a larger philosoph philosophical debate about how much God is sort of ordering human affairs so that they are progressive, so that they, they do have a moral dimension. Um, I guess what, I, what interested me in, in, in this topic is that there's, so many people are responding and aware of Lisbon beyond this philosophical community. Merchants and priests and slaves and settlers and people all over the Atlantic world, which is really the, the geographical area that I study. And so it seemed like um, the most famous event that had not been studied uh, in its fullest dimensions. So um, I guess my approach to it is, is to, to be aware of that uh, intellectual side of things. But to also note that lots of people who weren't philosophers also had a stake in what happened in Lisbon and a reaction to it. 
I think there was an earthquake right while you were telling that. We lost our connection <laughs> to the web. I think it's gone. Liesl, do you want to come try to bail it, or is it really gone? May not come back. Uh, Max, I actually had a follow-on question. How long did it take the people outside of Portugal to forget the earthquake compared well, I've, to the... When Lisbon? I looked at... I'm studying Portuguese, and it's coming along pretty slowly. So uh, a lot of my uh, reaction is combined to, confined to the English and some of the German literature. Um, what strikes me about, uh, about Lisbon is that I keep seeing publications about it um, decades after the fact. It's still capturing people's attention. Uh, for instance, in 1800, some artist painted a, a new one of these images that I showed you, a new picture of destruction in Lisbon, and displayed it in London with a new narrative of what happened. This is a 45 years after the fact of this earthquake. It's big enough draw to publicize and to advertise and to capture people's attention. So one of the things I think is different, perhaps, about the way we experience natural disasters versus the way the Lisbon earthquake was experienced is that you know, I mean, people still, I think, are aware that this tsunami of December 2004 happened, but I think it had its news cycle for most American viewers, and it's been filed away. Um, so maybe it lasted longer than most crises, maybe a month or two, but Lisbon lasted for decades. So the way people used disasters and remembered them, I think, had more endurance uh, after something like Lisbon. But Lisbon also maybe is almost comparable to the World Trade Center attacks. I mean, this is a major European metropolis that f that is destroyed. So it's sort of comparable to that level, and maybe, uh, so maybe, maybe there is there's a basis for comparison. But people remembered for decades. Into the 19th century, Lisbon was narrated and depicted and, and consumed by people. There are, there are other questions from the audience? Um, I have a question for Irfan that um, came up in our uh, preparing for this, but hasn't come up so much here, and it was common. Um, we saw the tents both Two of the speakers mentioned tents, and I think, Irfan, you said that um, all, if there was another emergency, all of the tents in the world are basically in Pakistan. Yep. Um, would you like to comment on that and a little more on the, what we've called the disaster within the disaster? Yeah, I was, uh, uh, when we were talking in our internal discussions, was referring that Pakistan uh, is the largest manufacturers of tents in the, in the world. And so uh, with uh, 2.5 million people displaced, uh, there were uh, not enough tents in the country and not uh, enough tents in the world to get to, to them. So Kofi Annan actually made a statement that if there was another disaster today, there will not be uh, any tents uh, in the world to cater to that. Uh, and so at the same time, we're not talking about uh, generally the, this canvas tents that uh, are generally made, but we they were wanting these weatherproof uh, tents which could uh, withstand these uh, Himalayan cold uh, minus uh, temperatures. And so those tents uh, are still not there. So most of those people who are being put in tent cities are being put in tent cities in Islamabad, which is, rel is, not, is relatively less colder than the, the Himalayan part uh, of the affected areas. Uh, but uh, so some of the reports that you may also have seen and they're carried by CNN and others, is that those canvas tents, uh, they, they, these families are uh, sitting there, but they are shivering, and they, they, whenever it rains, they get wet, and so there is no shelter, so to speak. So that's, that's the tragedy that we're talking about. So, so the, the, in terms of international uh, the disaster preparedness, uh, this is an issue which uh, needs to be addressed, <clears throat> not only on a regional level, but on an international level, that how do you respond to these uh, rapid uh, rapidly, and also that you have enough storage and enough uh, housing and shelter and the like. There are other questions? Well, um, I'd like to invite you to, oops, I'm sorry. It takes me a while to get up. Um, is this going, I'm, I'm thinking both in Pakistan and, and potentially here, uh, being a person who lives in a house with an unreinforced masonry basement, <laughs> um, do you think that it will change the, the building culture, so to speak, in, in Pakistan? And do you think that the building culture in the US, particularly in our community, 
could be changed. Um, every time you speak of upgrading some code, uh, there's a bunch of people say, oh, this will make it so expensive that people won't be able to afford new houses, et cetera, et cetera, which seems to me to be a short-sighted view. See, so I, do you want, you want to comment, Jay, and maybe Rob, you'll have some thoughts? Yes, I could address that. It's uh, certainly throughout the United States, uh, the building code officials and the volunteers, really many volunteers who write the building codes are well aware of the disasters that occur around. And incrementally over time, those disasters will impact the building codes, I feel. Uh, one of the more obvious examples in this country is hurricane after hurricane after hurricane. Uh, finally, in the last 10 years, the wind codes uh, have started to get more stringent, uh, for example, in places like Florida. Uh, but for the reasons that you stated, the resistance is very, very strong. And if you take a city like Memphis right now, uh, the business community is extremely resistant to having a substantial upgrade in the seismic capacity uh, in the building codes, extremely resistant. And so the politicians are, are responding to that accordingly. If you look at the mayor of Memphis, I'd say uh, he's relatively unsupportive of increasing the building codes. If you look at the mayor of Shelby County in which Memphis sits, uh, perhaps we can consider him a bit more enlightened, uh, and I'd say he's highly supportive. And so it's uh, quite political as well as quite technical, and it's, it's a pretty messy mishmash. At the national level, where the building codes start, I'd say there the views are relatively progressive. And uh, that's why the progress has been made. But it trolls all the way down to the local level. It's the local uh, entities that adopt whatever building code they want, and they can rewrite it from scratch if they want to. And uh, that's, that's where the difficulty is occurring. A little different perspective, Rob Olshansky has been following up, um, has worked on the Kobe earthquake and the, and the results and has some perspectives. Oh, um, I don't know if this has to do with that. I just wanted to add to what Jerry said that, um, you know, you were um, suggesting that, uh, that we really don't think about earthquakes when we build here and wanted to know what it would take to, to get that started. But, but the reality is, even though it's never um, quite as much as most of us would like, um, you know, again, as, as Jerry gave some examples where they're in, in Memphis and so on, and, and there are some places around here where we're still trying to improve things. Um, the reality is we, we have been changing the way we build. And um, the city of Champaign, the city of Urbana, they have the um, reasonably current building codes that are based on national standards that, you know, if you build a new building today in Champaign or Urbana, you are uh, building it according to the latest seismic codes that take into account the, the amount of shaking here. Now that's new buildings, the ex buildings that are already around. Your house, my house, has uh, is built the same way as yours. Um, you know, that's a, that's the other issue. But in terms of, of new buildings, we, we are gradually changing over time. Um, another question? Um, is, uh, given our, our keen awareness of recent natural disasters, um, plus other slow-burning disasters, uh, malaria, diseases, pending uh, avian flu outbreak, and our ability to wipe each other out through terrorism or other disasters man-made. Are we in a paradigm shift right now, or is that just presentism? Max, that seems like your ball. <laughs> Well, um, as a historian, I'm always reluctant to answer what's hap questions about what's happening right now. Um, uh, I'm wary enough about it, trying to figure out what happened in the past. Um, you know, I really don't know. I think, uh, and, and the things about paradigm shifts, I mean, when, when the term was developed by Thomas Kuhn, um, I think he imagined a sort of uh, what other people have called a ratchet effect, that once the thing has happened, things are clicked into place in a new way that don't go back. And I'm not entirely sure that natural disasters don't have, I'm not sure if they have a ratchet effect or not, or if it's just varied depending on the circumstance. I think people have an enormous capacity to forget trauma and to go back to business as usual. And in some ways that can be really negative. So good policy initiatives that would prevent damage and mitigate it in the future, that gets undone by people going back to business as usual. But of course it's probably good to forget about trauma so you can go on living your life and you're out of the shadow of this uh, you know, it's bad to think that human affairs are only going to get worse and that 
or just around the corner, there's a, a huge trauma coming. So I'm just sort of as a citizen, as someone who's thinking about my own basement right now, uh, I'm trying to think about whether I want to be obsessed uh, with the details of how to prepare well, or whether I, you know, I just have to put some of that potential trauma out of my mind. So I think you only know if there's a paradigm shift after the fact. You can't really know it as it's going on. I think that this might be a good place to close because the last question gives me a chance to advertise this series. Um, we're going to look at mega disasters, uh, possibly um, floods, let's see, floods, volcanic eruptions, um, tsunamis, plagues. I always get my list um, mixed up, and whatever else comes along. And to some extent, our timing is going to be determined by what's going on in the world. So uh, the Center for Advanced Study has actually reserved a couple of rooms throughout spring, spring semester in case something happens, because um, we thought of this mega catastrophe mega catastrophe initiative the Friday before Katrina. And we realized that we could add Katrina and and move. But it turned out it was really hard to find a room on campus um, that was available. So we are planning ahead a little bit. Um, and my goal is also to work into uh, what I'm calling creeping mega catastrophes, which are the loss of potable water, water quality, loss of soils, population pressures. So um, I'd appreciate it if you keep your eye out for the series. And especially if something happens, we'll be trying to act on it fairly fast. And thank you for coming. And thank you to the, the panel. Did I? Rob? I, I, I just wanted to, not realizing you're closing, I just <laughs> to say Sorry. since um, uh, this one is about earthquakes and the other ones are about other things, um, I just wanted to, uh, for me in my work, I wanted to make a point that I think earthquakes are really um, notably different than a lot of those other kinds of disasters. And probably each one of them is unique in their own way as well. Um, but uh, earthquakes, more than any of these other ones, and certainly in contrast to the creeping disasters you're talking about, earthquakes happen suddenly, instantaneously, without any kind of warning whatsoever. And um, and I think this has a lot of implications. A lot of the things that we were talking about here in terms of the uh, psychological effects of earthquakes. And, and you know, I think a lot of the effects of the, of the earthquake in, in Lisbon, for example, is just people's realization that you know, at one moment there's this, this city here, which is one of the great capitals of, of Europe and, and of the um, uh, civilized world at the time. You know, then 10 seconds later, it's suddenly not there anymore without any kind of warning at all. And, and to me, this is what's really interesting about earthquakes, and I think it has, um, it, it's why it captures a lot of people's imagination, has a lot of psychological effects, probably a lot of uh, philosophizing results from that. And from my point of view, in terms of policy, it's also really significant because it means we can't give any kind of warning. And so it means that um, uh, mitigation is, is really important. And in places like mid-America that have um, relatively few earthquakes, or even as we saw on the map in, in Kashmir, where uh, you know, maybe you know, it is a seismically active area, but they haven't had a magnitude 7 earthquake there for a long time, um, it's, it's, it's very hard to get people to, to prepare. Um, but you can't, unlike New Orleans, you don't have 72 hours worth of warning. There's, you know, it, just, it happens instantly. And so from a policy point of view, earthquakes are a continual challenge to try and you have, to be, you have to be ready, always. Um, and and you know, in a world when there's so many other things we're, we're worried about, it, it's very difficult. So I think there's a lot of things that are, are really special and different about earthquakes um, that uh, I didn't want to, since this is our earthquake session, I didn't want to let it end without uh, touching okay. on some of those. Oh, but we still have a whole session for New Madrid coming. OK. <laughs> and I, I wanted to point out that with the creeping mega catastrophes, there's a whole lot of moral issues because they are potentially something that we as humans um, are either participating in, causing, um, can think about. And so there, there are a whole lot of issues that will probably evolve and there will be similarities and differences. And part of the question is, what can we learn, right or wrong, from what we've done with mega catastrophes to deal with the creeping mega catastrophes? OK, we've got, <laughs> I, I was hoping that would. Yeah, Nick. This is uh, Robert McCombs of Religious yeah. Studies. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to comment that um, uh, an obvious difference between uh, what we're dealing with today and some of the things that we're going to deal with in the future uh, is that uh, some of the things we're going to deal with in the future are things that we can avoid. 
um, in the case of dealing with, with, with uh, earthquakes and so forth, we're talking about how to react to something that we can't stop. Um, it might be, to link up with Max's talk, it might well be the case that what we would need to do in order to avoid some of the things we can avoid is actually to go through some kind of paradigm shift um, to link with Max's first point. To li link with Max's second point, it might well be the case uh, that that would actually enable us to live much more optimistically. Um, uh, th and I'd just like to plant those two ideas uh, by way of linking this discussion to some of those future discussions. Thank you. Um, are there any more postscripts? I think I triggered them. <laughs> well, thank you, and I hope to see you back at a future session. <laughs>